Tonight on Talking Politics, should the Boston Globe have run columnist Kevin Cullen's recent piece on medical aid in dying after they learned that he signed a legal form related to the process for the woman whose story he was chronicling? I'll talk to a pair of journalists and media analysts ahead. But first, the Melnia Cass Recreation Complex in Roxbury is usually home to community groups, local sports teams, and after-school activities. Right now, though, it's home to dozens of unhoused migrant families, many of whom were sleeping at Logan Airport before Governor Maura Healey turned the complex into temporary shelter earlier this week. Temporary being the operative word for the governor. First of all, it is temporary. We will be out before June. It is important to have this site available to the community. But not everyone in the community is on board, and many are raising the question, why this particular community center? I'm joined now by Louis Elisa, the former president of the Boston branch of the NAACP, former regional director of the Federal Emergency, Emergency Management Agency, and president of the Garrison Trotter Neighborhood Association in Roxbury. Also by reporter Sarah Bettencourt, my GBH News colleague. She's been covering the state's migrant crisis for GBH News. Thank you both for being here. Uh, Sarah, you spent some time with a family at Logan a few days ago for a really great piece that you wrote for us. Can you just describe their situation a little bit? They were coming here from Haiti, but they'd had a long road to get here. Yeah, absolutely. So on Saturday night, um, I spent a few hours at Logan Airport. And I was actually surprised to see there weren't a lot of migrant families. I think that was because there had been so much media coverage for the previous three days before. But after I'd waited around a few hours, there were um, there was a family. And the mother's name was Chrysla, um, and she was 30 years old. She had two children and a husband, and she was laying on a blanket. She was very heavily pregnant, and she talked about how they had journeyed from Haiti to the Dominican Republic and Chile back in 2017, but they struggled to build a life there, and she had heard that a lot of groups are willing to support families here in Boston, so they arrived in January to Texas and then came to Logan Airport this week. And my recollection is that she was she was sick, correct? She was coughing under the weather, as you spoke yeah, with definitely. her? Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, and, and one of her children was as well. And that family was here on humanitarian parole. Some of our viewers will know what that means, some will not. What is humanitarian parole? So when asylum seekers cross the border and claim asylum, usually they're brought in by border agents or border customs and border protection. And sometimes they're detained for a few days, sometimes they're not. And they're usually released with uh, some paperwork that says you can live here in the United States for two years without fear of deportation. Depending on the president, um, sometimes that's extended, but it really depends on the country you're coming from. Um, and that's the paperwork that Chris Lowe's family had. Okay, thank you. Uh, Louis Elisa, you are steeped in this community that we're talking about here, where the unhoused migrants are now being um, given housing in the Melnia Cass Center. What is your sense of whether this is uh, a move that is wise, uh, is good for the community, or is not? My first sense is this is an incredibly humane thing to do, that having people sleep at Logan Airport or on the street or any place else is not humane. And that is not what we're about as American citizens, and clearly in the city of Boston, this is supposed to be open and friendly. It's not the best move based on the logistics that is supposed to come. That means for the amount of people that are there now, it's a workable site. For the amount of people that is supposed to come, they said possibly 400 people, that would be incredibly um, poor choice of a place to have occupation. One thing that, that I want to highlight here is you've done, we mentioned that you work for FEMA, you've also worked via uh, FEMA for NATO, right? In, Correct. All over the world in a bunch of different disaster contexts. So you, you're Dis intimately acquainted with this kind of stuff. Disasters and crises and, and from flooding to fires and things of this nature. So understanding that when people are in a crisis and that you have a challenging situation, you have to come up with a solution. So we should understand there are over 7,000 migrants that the state has been already housing. I think the issue with this being a population that were mostly Haitian, there's a need to have people to be able to communicate 
with the people that are coming in for their mental health and their social well-being. And so choosing this community might have been not just the move to get them housed, but also to put them in an environment where they might find people they could, in which they can communicate. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that point. That's actually something that, that hadn't occurred to me, and that's an important point. Um, Sarah Betancourt, what else is the state and what are private organizations that are working with migrants, what else are they doing to accommodate this continuing inflow of migrant families with the state's traditional shelter system at capacity? So um, the shelter capacity is comprised of about 48% migrants right now. So that's about 3,623 families as of last Thursday. Um, and a lot of refugee resettlement agencies and local groups like the Immigrant Family Services Institute, a Mattapan-based organization, have been doing this work for a long time and in earnest in the past year. Um, we just published a, a piece a few minutes ago about what church groups are doing um, and also what private residents can do to support this. And that could be anything from opening up your home if you have an in-law apartment and going through an organization who will likely vet you. Um, in housing a migrant family for a few months, all the way to if you have a driver's license and you, you can take them to a local food pantry or to a doctor's appointment. Uh, anything that's small or large is, is helpful, a lot of folks are saying. Uh, just so I'm clear on this, are there other sites akin to the Melnia Cass site that are currently being operated by the state? I'd seen some discussion, uh, I think, on Universal Hub when I was reading that website of a, a site in Medford that was either opened up or might be opened up. Are there other sites like this or is this the only one? I don't know about a site in Medford, but in Cambridge, there's a former courthouse that's in operation to help migrant families. And that's been since just before December when there was a deadline instituted by the legislature to have overflow shelters created. Um, and in the past, Joint Base of Cape Cod has been opened mm -hmm. up to migrant families twice um, during the Martha's Vineyard incident. And also more recently, I think it was last summer as well. Louis Lisa, when you said that this was not a good venue long term, given the number of people who are going to be coming, what is it specifically about the Melnia Cass Recreation Center that makes it limited in terms of its ability to, to provide services? The lack of light, lay down space for people to stretch out, people who are cramped together, the, bed, the cots are like one foot apart. And there's you know, there's not clear demarcations of where people are. When you have mothers and children with infants, mothers feeding, uh, breastfeeding, and have all those other social and personal issues, you need to have more space. You need to be able to isolate them and let them isolate. The relationship of the uh, restroom facilities, the bathrooms and showers, that creates a problem if you have children, you don't want your children to go too far away in order to be able to use facilities. We have, the state has in this, um, in this repertoire, places they can go. My recommendation is to use the Shattuck Hospital that's still in operation, 85% of which is usable, to 15% is being used by other programs. My idea is that when you mentioned the word refugees, they're not refugees because then we'd be under international regulations to manage them. But as migrants and legal migrants at this, we need to make sure they're being housed in a humane way. And I think that the challenges for this center as to other places, this center had programs going on. They had youth programs, sports programs. And so it's challenging because those programs are now being displaced. Maybe for a short period of time, we might make the deadline as the governor said, but you know, now we have to say, how do we accommodate the young children who are in school who live here and have challenges now? So we're gonna be looking at the Reggie Lewis Center. I'm hopeful they'll be looking at Madison Park High School and other places that we might be able to these young people who have programs might be able to go so that they're not totally left out in the cold. Uh, I want to play a little bit of video from State Senator Liz Miranda, who was talking about um, her response to this, uh, this particular situation. Let's take a look at how she framed it, and then I want to get both of you to respond to her comments. We are a people who help people in their worst moments, and we have always been that. Now I wholeheartedly understand that our community has been asked to sacrifice a great deal. We are in a state of emergency and none of us should stand by while women, children and families sleep outside or in an airport who look like us. 
So we saw some signs that were being held by people who were opposed to this move, which said essentially, Louis Lisa, you know, why here, why not Wellesley, yes. I believe. What do you think the answer to that question is? Get educated. There are places around the state in which migrants and are being housed right now. It's not just Boston. It's not just Chelsea. We've gone through a, n a number of series of migrants and other people challenged. And remember that during Katrina and Rita back in 05, yeah. you know, we had the challenge of getting migrants coming in. Their joint base in uh, Cape Cod was where they housed a lot of people. They were housed around the city. They don't understand what's going on when they put up signs like that. Wellesley may not be a site, but there are other sites throughout the state in which migrants are at. We've got, we're about 7,500 migrants in there now but you know I don't see the signs um, you know when we have Ukrainian refugees or when we have people coming in from Kosovo and different places it's only to a community where folks don't understand they're there for humanitarian reasons and the senator was absolutely correct this is a situation where the people in that center look like the people in this neighborhood and many of them have relatives and friends and they need to be there for social and emotional support but there needs to be a clear obligation on the part of the state that they will get that center back in place and if there's opportunities for young people and programs to go somewhere we should work with that. Sarah how frequent is it to see uh, people expressing concern about the burden being placed on a particular community when migrants or unhoused people are placed there? Given the current state of housing and its price and also the level of housing stock it, it happens pretty often but I have to echo a lot of what Lewis said. There's a lot of municipalities ranging from Woburn to Lexington, dozens of communities that are emergency shelter sites and have brought in migrants um, through the state emergency shelter contract, local hotels and, and local shelters. And a lot of these communities have been incredibly welcoming. Now, when it comes to the Melnia Cass Recreation Center, I know there were other facilities that were considered, including um, East Boston's Suffolk Downs and also West Roxbury is that I think it was recreation or education complex. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really curious to see why exactly Melnia Cass was chosen, but I think part of what Lewis said about you know migrants feeling more comfortable there, um, a lot of their Haitian Creole being spoken in the area might be part of it as well. Um, and it's going to be really interesting to see what happens in the future because this issue isn't going away and people will continue to need humanitarian relief. Lewis, it's been suggested as this has played out that there may end up being um, some type of benefit moving forward for Roxbury, for the uh, Melnia Cass Center in particular, that it may be refurbished, for example, that local vendors may benefit from this. It may sound callous for me to be talking about benefit to the, the neighborhood or benefit to the facility when we're dealing with people whose lives have been upended. But is that a reasonable thing for people to be thinking about, ways that there, there might be some sort of ancillary community benefit? Well, part of the outrage from the community was that, the, yes, there will be benefits. There should be benefits, but some of these benefits should have taken place before the center was being used this way. And people were really upset that now that they want to use it for this particular purpose. They're saying, well, here's things we can do. Some of those things should have been done long ago. The Friends of Melnia Cass, and which I'm a member, and Shirley Schellenford is the chair of the, of the board. You know, we've been asking for upgrades and improvements. Had they made that, this move might have been a little bit better, upgrading the facilities, the laboratories, and things of that nature. So yeah, there, there's going to be some change. There's going to be some improvements. But throughout Roxbury, we've been asking for change. And DCR and the state, of course, is a partner in all the things to we're doing some way so yeah there will be some things but now there are things that can happen right now but first we have to deal with the humanitarian crisis All right. that's with us and for the majority of the community they're good with that gotta leave it there lewis elisa and sarah Bettencourt. thank you both for being here to talk about this it is one of the cardinal rules of journalism don't get personally involved in the story but that's exactly what boston globe columnist kevin cullen did while reporting on the story of a terminally ill woman who traveled to Vermont to die by medically assisted suicide. The woman, Linda Bluestein, needed two people to attest that she was in a clear state of mind as she made her decision, and Colin agreed to be one of them. 
In an editor's note, the Globe said the decision violated the paper's standards, but, quote, did not meaningfully impact the outcome of this story. So did they make the right call in publishing it anyway, particularly since there is a renewed push to legalize medical aid in dying here in Massachusetts? I'm joined by Kelly McBride, Senior Vice President and Chair of the Craig Newmark Center for Ethics and Leadership at the Pointer Institute and the Public Editor for National Public Radio and journalist Susie Banacarum, host of the podcast In Retrospect with Susie Banacarum and Jessica Bennett, which just launched its second season. Thank you both for being here. Kelly, uh, let me begin with you. What is your take on the appropriateness or lack thereof of Kevin Cullen attesting that Linda Bluestein was in a clear state of mind and not operating under any duress as she made her decision to take her own life? At the point that he did that, that he signed that paper, which was about six months before she actually ended her life, um, he put himself in a really horrible set of conflicting loyalties because he had a loyalty to his story and to see his story go forward. And then he also had a loyalty to observe her journey because the, the thing that makes it so interesting in following someone as they make those final decisions is it's really hard, it's complicated, and they face all sorts of um, emotional turmoil, um, family issues. And at the point that he did that, that he signed that paper, he basically was rooting for his story to go forward as opposed to being attached to simply observing what happened. And I think he would have had a much better story. It would have been much more interesting to watch as she figured this out. She certainly was capable, the woman who was the subject of his story, she sued the state to be allowed to pursue this avenue for herself. So she obviously had the wherewithal to find other people to sign that paper. So I, I find it baffling that he made that choice. Susie, what's your take on this question? I agree with Kelly. I mean, listen, there are times when you become too close to a subject, but that's generally a rookie mistake. And this is not a rookie. This is not like someone at the beginning of their career. This is someone who should have known better. And I think one thing that really struck me in the story is that right before he mentioned that he had signed this um, letter, he told the story of another patient who had really struggled to find someone to sign their paper. And to me, he materially changed the outcome of the story. If the purpose of the story was to educate other people who might wanna pursue this avenue, he skipped a step essentially by being the person who signed this and not having other you know, things that she would have had to do to get to the point where she ended up. So I agree. I think from an ethical perspective, it's absolutely not the right decision. It's not that you can never do something if you're in a life or death situation and you have to intervene. There are occasional times when those kind of ethical breaches make sense. But in this particular case, it just felt like something he should have known better than to do. I wanna ask each of you, Susie, then you, Kelly, does it make any difference that he is described by the Globe as both a reporter and a columnist, which are two roles that we tend to think of as at least a little bit different. If we think of him taking this step while wearing his columnist hat as opposed to his reporter hat, does it look any better? Susie, you first and then Kelly. I mean, I, I guess it's an interesting question because if he was um, an opinion writer, maybe it would be slightly different. If this was a piece of advocacy where it was clear that he was advocating for this position, maybe there would have been slightly more argument that it wasn't such a breach. But in fact, in this case, they put an editor's note on the story and they said themselves that it violated their standards. So they didn't feel like there was a difference between being a reporter or a columnist in this case. And I feel like we should take the globe at their word that this was an ethical breach. And this wasn't the first time Kevin Holland had had an ethical breach, right? This is the second time previously he was suspended for some embellishment during his Boston Marathon bombing reporting. So I think the other thing that struck me in this story as odd is that there don't seem to have been any additional consequences for Kevin. They just attached this note. Hold that consequences thought because that's where okay. I want us to wrap up uh, the convo. Kelly McBride, is it in any way exculpatory that Kevin Collin is both a columnist and a reporter as described by his employer? 
Not in this particular case, no. If he had been doing a story about a friend of his who was going through this process and he was completely transparent that he had a personal relationship with this person, that would have been a very different story and very interesting, right? I don't think that that would have been any less valuable than this particular story. But in this case, this woman made herself part of the public conversation by filing a lawsuit so that she could have the ability to um, take her own life in Vermont when she was not a resident of that state. And she won that lawsuit. And that was how the media became aware of her. Mm -hmm. And so he came in as an outsider. And um, there is also value in that sort of distant observation and just watching somebody as they walk through a very difficult and intimate process. And so, um, I mean, I agree it's a rookie mistake. And I also think that one of the things that some columnists have trouble doing is figuring out when they really are part of the story and when they're not part of the story. Because just because you're an opinion columnist doesn't mean that you are a central character in every story. And in this case, um, and I mean, and his previous ethical breach as well, he kept making himself a central character of the story, unnecessarily so, right? And that I think is 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 also problematic. We should probably, I, I wanted to get to his suspension back in 2018, I believe three months without pay for fabricating details about what he experienced in connection to the Boston Marathon bombings, not in his work at the Globe, but in public appearances, appearances in other media. And I think we actually have a clip of that at a panel in 2013 on C-SPAN, which Kelly, I believe you were a part of. So let's take a look at what Kevin Cullen had to say about Boston Marathon bombing related matters in that 2013 panel. Deputy Fire Chief Joe Finn, a great, great fireman, grabbed me, he said, he had his iPhone, he was like this, he goes, because this is Sean, Sean O'Brien. He goes, I can't get him out of the house. And he goes, talk to him. I go, what do you mean talk? What do you mean? I go, hey, Sean, it's Kevin. Like, yeah, I know. Um, why don't you come on? I'll come down and have a drink with me and Joe. And I don't even know what I'm talking to him about. He goes, no, I don't want to come out. I don't want to come out. And I go, what the okay, well, listen, I'll see you later. And I said, I, I said to Joe, I said, was, was Sean at the scene? And he said, uh, well, he goes, Sean found the kid. And that's when I found out that the boy had died. And that was determined by an investigation, I think two investigations conducted by the Globe uh, to have been fabricated. Uh, I want to ask another question about possible mitigating factors here. It was not my sense in reading the piece that Kevin Cullen inserted himself into the story the way we saw him insert himself into that uh, apparently bogus anecdote about the Boston Marathon bombings. I actually thought the story was very compelling, both his reporting and the photos, which were, I thought, remarkably moving, taken by Jessica Rinaldi. We got to see Linda Bluestein in a whole bunch of different situations as she headed toward ending her life. I, I found the, the combination of the photos and the reporting to be very evocative. For me, I had the same reaction that both of you had when I first learned this had happened. I thought to myself, no, 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 you just can't do that. He, he became part of the story. He changed the outcome of the story or changed the way it unfolded. But then I found myself thinking, those of us in the media, when we cover a story like this, we are accustomed to individuals opening up access to an incredibly sensitive and fraught and difficult period in their lives. It's, a, it's an ask that we tend to make of members of the public. And as a rule, you know, our coverage is something that we give them in return, but we don't give them much back. We get access at a time when people are very vulnerable. I found myself thinking, is it really that big a deal that Kevin Cullen chose to attest to the sound, you know, mental state of a woman who had taken him, taken him and his photographer into her life with this depth and with this level of richness? Is there any case to be made for this as a sort of a, the returning of a favor that was done to Colin and his photographer by Linda Bluestein? You know, I think the returning of the favor is a well-told story, a story told with dignity and with compassion. And, and I agree, he did do that. It is a, it is a really well-told story. Um, but I don't think, 
that I think it actually became a distraction. I think if he thought it was a favor to her, um, he didn't do her any favors because we're talking about this rather that's than a very good the rest point. of the story. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's also my point of view. I sort of feel like I hear what you're saying. We do ask a lot of people. But in this case, this was a woman who had chosen to do a lot of advocacy around this issue. She wanted to open up her home and tell her story in an effort to in an effort to help people, right? And in this case, the thing that you're doing for this woman is telling her story. And to me, that's the argument for publishing the story, despite the fact that he made this mistake, right? I think they sort of owed it to this woman to tell her story after having taken up so much of her time and having, you know, essentially uh, taken advantage of her generosity in this case. So I do think the, the Globe made the right decision to publish because of that, but I don't think it was the right decision to sign this paperwork. It just feels like it wasn't necessary. And yes, it's been such a distraction that it's taken away from this very moving piece. I agree. It's really a, a good piece of journalism. The paper, as I understand it, and Kelly, I can't remember if you mentioned this earlier, I believe they learned about what we've been discussing here after Linda Bluestein had died and after the story had been filed. Susie, you just said you think publishing was the right call despite this wrinkle. Kelly, do you agree? Yeah, I do. But I think it's telling that he didn't tell any of his editors back in July when he signed it and that it was as they were getting the story ready to go into production that they realized that there was this complication that needed to be explained with an editor's note. All right, final question for both of you, and we'll go Kelly and Susie and leave it there. Should there be some sort of sanctioning, do you think, of Kevin Cullen for the way this played out and the step that he took? I mean, that's up to the that's up to the newsroom. We don't know that there hasn't been, right? We, we, we haven't heard of anything publicly, but we don't know that there hasn't been. And I really think that that is between him and um, Nancy Barnes, the editor of The Globe. Susie, you got yeah, the last I, word. Yeah, I agree. It's not really for us to say, obviously we're not in the newsroom, but I will say this, that you know, if you have a reporter who's had ethical breaches in the past and you publicly state that this is an ethical breach, you are in danger of setting a standard in your newsroom that there are different rules for different people. Because, you know, one assumes that any other reporter who had had two ethical breaches would have some consequence for that, especially at the second time. So uh, my instinct as an outsider, which is like, you know, I'm here to give my opinion, is that there probably should be some consequence to this to make a point to the newsroom that this isn't acceptable. And when you do things that aren't acceptable, there are you know, results. But in the end, you know, I've led a lot of newsrooms and you make decisions and you don't always make them public. And so yeah. I, I'm going to give Nancy Barnes grace here because that's what I would want. <laughs> and to, to that point, we did ask the paper if there was going to be some sort of sanctioning and they said they do not comment on personal matters. Susie Banakaram, Kelly McBride, thank you both for talking this thorny issue through. Thanks for having Thanks, me. Bye. That's it for tonight, but do come back next week, and please let us know what you think. The email is talkingpolitics at wgbh.org. The website's gbhnews.org slash talkingpolitics. And while you're at it, sign up for our politics newsletter. For now, thanks for watching, and good night. Crimes are linked.